Well, first of all, I think oh, we're going to have a computer up here, correct? Um, first of all, I, I want to say I've been doing this. Uh, my first study was with Jerry Levy at Emory University, and we measured the the end results, the, the circulating heparin and auto transfusion in the early 1980s. So I've been into blood management for quite some time. As we've heard all the speakers talk about this morning, you know, there's not just one, one piece of the puzzle as far as blood management. Again, disclosure, I have no financial ties to any of the companies that are here. This presentation is going to be leading into the workshop that we're going to have right after this in which you'll be guided through the lunch lines and therefore you'll get a color-coded card in which you'll go to each one of the stations. So I'm just kind of the, and I want to thank each one of the manufacturers that are, are helping us out with their auto transfusion devices and sequestration products. So again, you know, even though anemia is bad, and we've all basically been saying it all morning, you know, blood products can be much worse. It's kind of the kiss of death. You know, gift of life is what they call blood. You know, it can also be the kiss of death. So, you know, we got to know when we're giving blood and how we need to give blood, how much to give blood. So there's so many different algorithms and pieces of the puzzle, which we've heard about this morning, that contribute to a blood management system. Now, how many people in this room are doing blood management at their hospital or involved directly with the blood management programs? Quite a few. You know, I highly recommend each one of you get involved at your institutions. So if we can use the patient's own blood as their blood bank, couldn't we do a lot better? And I'm going to show that in basically a study that was done with my colleagues in patient as far as blood product usage and using the patient as their own blood. Again, as I said before, there's many, many pieces of the puzzle. When I see present people say, well, we have a blood management program with my company. Well, they only have one piece of the puzzle. There's so many different pieces of the puzzle that you need to incorporate and bring to the table as in a blood management program. It's not just one thing. It could be basically a multi, your multidisciplinary team, getting everybody out of that silo effect and bringing those teams together. Evidence-based education, which we just heard about from Colleen. And you know, so we need the evidence base. Basically, data. Data is so important. You know, if, it's, if, you, if you're not sure, collect the data within your own institute. And then, you know, looking at your, your, you know, your devices that you can use in your programs that can help you in a blood management program. So again, these all impact what we do in the surgical area. And not only in cardiac surgery, but hospital-wide. And I'm going to show that a little bit later. So how many people have gotten the new 2017 guidelines for AABB? How many people know that now you're basically, it's not four hours, it's not six, it's eight hours, so that you can basically have your blood eight hours after collection, and that your A and H is up to 24 hours. So they've expanded the use of our blood in our, you know, collection for our blood and blood products with our auto transfusion devices. Again, here it is, intraoperative blood, 24 hours, intraoperative blood collected and recovered, eight hours. So these are the new AABB guidelines. Thank God they finally woke up and expanded a little bit more time with the use of our blood products. How many people were, not now, how many people were using PRP in their cardiac surgical arena five years ago? How many people are using it today? Still quite a few, but it's really dropped off, and I can't understand why, because when you look at this paper that just recently came out, you can see that by the use of the PRP, they dropped their, their wound infection, their deep sternal wound infection, from 2.0 to 0.6. And if you look at the cost that is a, you know, in the use of PRP, there's a, you can pay right here, you can pay for the use of PRP in the whole year in one sternal infection. 
that you have. So even one patient, two patients, it may get, you know, you think it's only going from 2.0 to 0.6, but that may be two patients in your practice that you could have avoided in a deep sternal wound infection, which makes a huge significant difference. So this is the current methodology that we use today in our practices around the country, and I'd like to get, you know, how many patients at the end of the case just reinfuse directly, they're trying to get as much of their volume from their circuit back into the patient at that point in time. Pa you know, they, they put, give them nitroglycerin, they more or less. How many people bag and just bag their blood out of their pump and give it to anesthesiologists? Yeah, nobody. That's pretty good. That's amazing. How many people send it to their cell saver and wash it? Uh, quite a few. Quite a few. How many people use MUF or modified ultrafiltration to basically at the end of their case? How many people have used the HEMA bag or use the HEMA bag at this point in time? Uh, no show of hands. So you can see by there's different ways that we've been using our blood and blood products, you know, for our patients, but I'm going to show you a different technique and a, a more, to me, a simple technique that we've proven and that it's going to change your whole transfusion practice at your institutions. And hopefully you'll be able to see it because they'll have actually bovine blood in the, in the back room that they're going to be spinning with some of these devices. So again, we started this, you know, I started it in, I think it was, it was about 2005 we started thinking about this. And I thought, what a simple method if we take the blood from you know, we were doing A and H, but then they had to put the, the blood on the rocker. If we had to give the blood during the case, we were given all the blood with all the coagulation factors and everything else during the case. So, you know, I thought, well, wonder if we could started thinking about separating this. So we did it with the BRAT as our first device, and then we expanded it. And what we did is this was, we developed a blood component separation kit that had three different bags in it, and you'll, you'll see this with different devices. And it had a collection apparatus that where we collected, and this is such a simple technique. It only takes, takes just a couple of minutes to set up. And you're really, you really, know, it's kind of like the Ronco cooker. You know, you don't just sit there and watch it. You watch it, you know, you leave it and forget it. And so anyhow, we look at here, we did, we finally did a study also with the Hemonetics Elite and using its device, and here are the products that we brought to the table on it, and they'll have their new system in, in the back room today. And we did it with the Francinius Cats, and they'll actually have their new system also in the back today, and this was their blood component separation kit. So we did it with all the devices that we could put together, four different devices and four different techniques. And what we did is we looked at the affluent volume port. We more or less, we clamp off our waste bag. They do a bag of A and H. And again, here's the separation bags. And also, Another technique is when they hand off the auto transfusion A and A line, they actually hand off a bag that is attached, has a 3 8 inch connector that they tuck into the drapes. So at the very beginning of the case, when they hand off the line, they hand off this other line, we hand that bag on the pole, we hook it up to our, ex our ancillary spike, which you'll see in the back room. And what we do is, at the end of the case, we don't, we use our pump blood and we spin it up in this bag and we use platelet PRP type sequestration to concentrate and get the fluid off that bag. And I'm going to show you the data that we collected by doing this and the platelet functions to these patients. And it's quite impressive. So this is another residual CPB line that we use to take off. Again, the value of this is the anesthesiologist can, we can separate these products, and I'm going to go through this. We can take that autologous draw that we take off the patient, 
we can separate it into products, but if you wanted, let's say your patient, you know, even if they come in with a low hematocrit, we can take this unit off and then give the RBCs back to the anesthesiologist, or we can use them on, while we're on cardiopulmonary bypass. But what are we not using? If you had just the A and H, we can continue to have the PRP and the platelet-rich plasma and plasma that we can wait until the post-protamine to give back to the patient. Therefore, we are not kind of like, you know, eggs. We're not beating these eggs around. We've basically preserved them and the clotting factors to that patient for the whole procedure. So again, what we're doing is component therapy for each and one. And this is so simple that we can do this in such an easy way. And it's giving us, basically we're using it as an auto transfusion. We're using it as a sequestration, dividing the patient's own blood, using the patient's own blood as their blood bank by doing basically platelet rich plasma, which was four times baseline. So it met the standards. Again, you can use you know, tabletop systems in your cardiac surgery area, but this basically cut the cost. There was hardly any cost at all to doing it in this methodology. So it was really cost efficient also by doing the PRP. Again, you know, our standard setup, you know, we, we pretty much all wrap and, you know, and take off our, as much fluid as we can as part of our blood management strategies during this time. You know, we take off the venous blood, and usually what our priming volume is around what? To go on bypass is around 500 mLs. So we've done a very excellent job as far as blood management with our circuits in reducing the volume that we give back to the patients, but can we do more? And again, we just take this bag and we put it back up and wait until the end of the case. So, but we learned so much. Actually, this study showed us other pieces of the puzzle that we didn't even really know about until we did the study and found out who our worst enemies are in the OR. So, it's going to show you that too. So, these were the study values that were measured. We looked at the procedure, including, we were just going to do this on cabbages. Our first patient, which was supposed to be a, you know, just a single double cabbage, ended up, had a porcelain aorta. We ended up doing cool, cool down circulatory arrest. We decided, okay, we're going to do, we're going to do the study and we're going to take all comers. So we continue the study. And we did roughly 20, 20 procedures using each device. And so therefore we, we measured everything. And we looked at their preoperative hemoglobin and crit. We looked at their preoperative tag. We looked at anesthesia volume. We looked at our platelet counts pre, and we looked at the tag on cardiopulmonary bypass in the warming stage. We looked at it, their platelet count in the warming stage. We looked at the pump volume that was added. We looked at the reinfusion the reinfusion part of what I was talking about, that line, we hooked up the reinfusion product that we gave from our pump at the end of the case. We looked at the reinfusion platelet count. We looked at, you know, you want to look at platelet count, but wonder if we're just destroying all the platelets. Well, we wanted to measure platelet function also. So, and then we looked at the intraoperative blood products that were given, postoperative blood products, postprotamine, hemoglobin crit, and all the way down to cardiopulmonary bypass times. So here's what we found with the, basically the hemoglobin retention. And this was with the BRAT, the extra, and the elite at that point in time. We can show the others. But if you look at it, you can see that preoperative hemoglobin with the BRAT was much lower with our patient population than the normal values. And if you look at the hemoglobin retention, we really didn't do too bad a job in retention and dropping our hemoglobin because of all our strategies that we use in the operating room. But look at our reinfusion product 
And again, you, what could you have done? You could have gotten the same result by what? Washing that all your pump blood? You would have gotten a high hemoglobin, correct? And then we looked at the patient's hemoglobin values when they left the operating room. And remember, there was four circulatory arrest cases in here. There was multiple valves, cabbages, all comers in all these patients. And if you look at our hemoglobin value before we left the room, it really was only about one, one or two points lower than when we started. So now let's look at platelet retention. Okay, you can look at platelet retention. This is a normal you know, platelet count when the patient came into the room. And again, the extra had a lower different platelet count. I, the rewarming stage on cardiopulmonary bypass. So what are we doing? We're doing a very good job of protecting the platelets during that period of time, correct? And I think, you know, look at the reinfusion part of our platelet retention. Why do you think the BRAT at that point in time was so much higher than all the others? Anybody? Anybody have any thoughts? Yeah, Baylor Bowl. Difference in configuration of the Baylor Bowl. Um, and if you look at the post-operative platelet counts, you know, we've done a very, very good job. Look at the platelet function. Here's the platelet function for our patients coming in. We did a great job on bypass, reinfusion platelet function. Look at the patient's platelet function before they left the room. It was almost identical to when the patient started. So, you know, by doing this process, by, by putting it in your cell saver, what have you done? By looking at this process of platelet function and platelet retention, what are you doing when you wash your cell saver your pump blood in your cell saver. Where's all that, where are all these platelets and everything going? Yeah, they're going, you're just throwing everything away. Everything that you did to basically benefit the patient, you just throw it away. Now you could do this, you know, you can go through a hemoconcentrator and have a hemoconcentrator. We don't hardly ever use a hemoconcentrator at, our, at some of our institutions. But by doing this, it's much cheaper, much better, I think we can get just as good or better results and we can reinfuse the whole pump blood and not miss a thing and flush the circuit out and have a prime circuit ready to go back on during these procedures. So what did I tell you that we found out about our, the worst enemy during the case? If you look at what we did as far as anesthesia volume, and again, this was five different anesthesiologists, five different CRNAs that were working on this case. We saw that the average anesthesia volume was for every case that we brought into the operating room was 1,700. That was the average. Our wrap volume was pretty much equal. Our priming volume was fairly equal with four different perfusionists that were going at it. It roughly was somewhere around five or 600. So what we found out is we knew what the, you know, we had the anesthesiologist names and we had the CRNA's names and we saw that in, there was really no difference in the types of cases that we were doing. But if you looked at, and we knew exactly who this was, anesthesia one was he was given pretty much almost 22 to 2,500, you know, of fluid during the case. And here's our anesthesia, anesthesiologist number five over here that was averaging only 700 a case. So we went back to these guys and we sat down with them. We sat down with the head of anesthesiology and we said, you know, some of your guys are basically just bringing a patient in, you know, so we've talked about how patients sometimes immediately, if they come to the ER, they just get two liters of fluid or in the cath lab setting. But it was just, you know, opening it up and he wasn't monitoring his fluid volume. And therefore, we reduced everybody's fluid volume during our procedures. So it helped us in kind of an added benefit by doing this study. 
So here's our tag tracings, and this was on our first circulatory arrest patient. And if you look at, excuse me, if you look at the baseline tag, and then if you look at the more or less the on bypass tag, and then if you look at the patient that's leaving the room, and this was on a cool down arch replacement circulatory race cabbage times two. We did fantastic. I mean, I think everything looks fantastic. This patient received zero blood products, intraoperatively or postoperatively. In fact, almost every patient in our study received zero blood products in the intraoperative or postoperative setting with one of our surgeons. So this was basically the routine patients that we saw in our cabbage population, and again, doing an excellent job, and with a reinfusion product going in at the end of the case, we showed pretty much that we were back to baseline. So our tag platelet function, our platelet function and what we were doing was giving us fantastic results. So we not only proved that we're not destroying the platelets by doing this, we're giving high platelet yield, which you saw in the previous slides, but we're also getting a very good platelet function. So we're not scrambling the eggs, okay? So again, when we started our blood management program at our institution, we showed that at that point in time, when I came there, it was 45.10% for cabbages for use of blood products in that institution. But by setting up a multidisciplinary blood management program and using all the tools, not just this one tool, by incorporating the tag, by incorporating the team, by collecting the data, by using the HMS, by bringing all these tools to the table, look where we are and look where, I mean, Dr. Travis for all cabbage was at 4.2. You know, the STS is roughly, all STS is at 36. But with all three of our surgeons, we were down to 13.5, and he was down to 4.2. 4 and actually, when, when, I, when I went to him at another institution and we set up the program there, he was still at that rate when we set up the whole blood management strategy. So again, you know, his, his, with this blood management program, I've also come a decrease in morbidity, decrease in time of ventilator, and less renal failure, in which we've shown in our multiple presentations today that if we don't give blood or if we can reduce, we're not, you know, we're not, it's not blood, you know, it's blood management, just reducing the number of units. If we can do that, we're beat basically. It's not blood conservation. We're not trying to conserve anything. We're trying to manage the amount of blood products that are given. So again, coming with this team, and again, you know, we, it was a multidisciplinary team. We had lab, we had ICU nurses, we had blood bankers, we had point of care. And when we pulled all these people together, you know, they would go, well, they kind of just looked and stared at each other at first and go, what am I here for? But when we started talking and bringing those silos together and understanding the philosophy of everybody else, we basically brought together a very good team structure at our institutions. And we've won multiple awards, national awards, lab awards, in blood management. And each and every one of you could do that today. So I guess the conclusion is, what's the benefits of doing this? As a &H, we did it on 95% of our patients. You know, our component separation and preservation. We're not just taking the blood off, putting it on a rocker. Because the other thing, too, is that's the other part of it, is by when you take the A&H, you have to keep moving it around. If you don't have it on a rocker, what's it going to do? It's going to sit there and clot. Because, but we, by separating the components, we don't have to worry about that. And again, we can give those RBCs back at any time and we keep the coagulation factors until the end of the case post-protamine. Again, reinfusion of high quality product increased the crit, platelets, fibrinogen, et cetera. There's really no additional outlay. I mean, it's a small kit. It takes very little. We set up the cell saver 
you know, dry setup each and every night. We just don't hook up the waste bag. We keep that disconnected. And we, if we come in in the middle of the night, we basically just connect the waste bag and we come in for an emergency bleeder or something like that. We can go right into the cell saver mode. But we just keep the kit right on top of the cell saver and we hook it up at the very beginning of the case. Time efficiency. There's no time. You know, using a hemoconcentrator takes time. By doing it this method, there's really no time involved at all. It's at the end of the case, they decannulate, they feel very comfortable, they hook up the arterial line, the arterial line and the venous line stay on the field, they don't have to, you know, you're ready to go back on at any time, and it's just a very safe method to do it. So in summary, blood management is critical in the success for all of us in the surgical arenas, not only in the cardiac arena, we do this hospital-wide in the orthopedic arena, um, and the neuro arena, we have blood management strategy. This provides us another weapon in the arsenal of blood management. It utilizes existing equipment already in the surgical suite and is very cost-effective, and it provides superior results. Overall, it provides a safe, effective, and proven benefit to the patient in the hospital. And with that, basically to me, as I always say, it's a no-brainer. And, uh, you know, do you have any questions? Thank you.